Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. Our guest today is Ambassador Catherine Tai. She is the U.S. Trade Representative. Thank you very much for being on the France 24 set. Thank you so much for having me. So you're part of uh, the first U.S. Uh, official delegation to come to France since uh, the roll over uh, the submarine deal uh, with Australia. Uh, we heard Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken uh, said, yes, the U.S. should have be done better at communicating. Mm. But in France here, the feeling is it's not so much about communication. Mm. This was betrayal, a stab in the back. How do you react to that? Well, I want to begin by um, uh, affirming um, history, which is that France is America's oldest friend and ally. Which is why there was this feeling of betrayal. Absolutely. But uh, this is a friendship that has endured the test of time over literally hundreds of years. And we're a younger country. So that is, uh, that is our entire existence. And from before we were the United States, I have every confidence that this friendship and this partnership will endure, I hope, for several hundred years more because of the commitment that we have to working through our issues, uh, to uh, this friendship and partnership, and because uh, our ability to continue to understand each other and work together is going to be critical to our ability to prosper into the future. Right. Those are very nice words. But the French want acts. They want action. What can you offer of France, the Europeans, mm -hmm. in, very concretely in your mm -hmm. area? I mean, we, we know there's, there are some tariffs that were slapped on uh, the European Union and, and so on. Will there be a gesture maybe uh, to try to lift them, for example? So from day one of President Biden's presidency, he has made clear the priority he places on the transatlantic relationship. And that's why I'm here in Paris this week. And that's why I will be here in To Europe. try to repair it. Maybe. Uh, well, but uh, it's, a, it's a, a demonstration of the commitment that has been there from the beginning of this administration. So, for example, in June, we had the U.S.-EU summit at which the United States and the European Union agreed to settle a 16-year dispute between us at the WTO on Boeing and Airbus. And as a result of that, tariffs came down. And as a result of that also, we've committed to working together on shared challenges in the aerospace sector that's going to benefit our companies and our workers. I also want to point out that the Trade and Technology Council that was established at the summit just met for the first time last week. In Pittsburgh. And yeah. In Pittsburgh. In, in Pittsburgh. And um, I also want to share with you and all of your viewers um, the um, success of that interaction in terms of the depth of the conversation that we are setting up to have and the cooperation and energy uh, that is going to come out of that in terms of uh, the U.S. and Europe uh, finding ways to work together on challenges that we share with respect to technology in our economy and also with respect to uh, competition from non-market economies. But what about the tariffs on steel and aluminium? Very um, concrete. Again, yes. are they going to be lifted? Will there be a deal with the European Union? I'm glad you raised that as well because that is my third example. We are working very hard. The deadline the is very soon. The deadline is soon. Yes, so will, absolutely. Will there be a, a well, deal? Well, I very much hope so. And that is what we are working towards. But let me put that in context as well, which is that we are collectively facing a global overcapacity problem that is distorting the market for producers here in Europe and also in the United States. So what we need to do around the steel and aluminum tariffs is, again, to understand each other, to put our work in the context of the larger challenges so that we can take down the temperature between us and uh, collectively link arms to address the larger problem that we are both facing. So there will be a deal. I sure hope so. Uh, I want to get to China, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, you've conducted a thorough review of uh, China, and you've decided to re-engage uh, China on a trade issue. You're supposed to meet at least virtually uh, the Chinese vice uh, premier. Why do you extend that uh, hand to China mm -hmm. despite a record that's not exactly stellar when it comes to trade policies? Well, we've had a lot of questions about whether or not we are headed towards a Cold War, whether or not we are in a Cold War. And I think that... Um, the answer uh, is yes? The answer is no, and that's why we must engage. That's why we have to have a bilateral relationship between the U.S. and China. 
But uh, is this meeting going to happen? And are you hopeful that uh, there'll be solutions? Because there have been rumors that instead of an olive branch, you would slap further sanctions on China or further tar tariffs. I mean, is this off the table right now? Well, I think that is the point of engaging, which is to see if we can uh, understand each other better. And we have taken steps in a speech I gave earlier this week to lay out uh, the U.S. Uh, vision for uh, how we will take steps to responsibly manage the competition and the challenges between the U.S. and Chinese economies. Right. In the meantime, uh, the tariffs that were put in place mm -hmm. by the Trump administration yes. remain in place just for a few exemptions. So it means that the Trump administration was right and that you're keeping them because you agree with what was done, correct? Well, there are a lot of pieces of uh, your logic and connective tissue there. Um, so let me just Is my cut logic through. wrong? Um, let me say this. As with uh, steel and aluminum, um, where there is, as a fact, a global distortive practice uh, that is affecting our industries, with respect to China, there is um, a, uh, a, a significant imbalance in our trading relationship. And I laid this out in my speech earlier this week around um, the impact of China's very muscular and extremely effective industrial policies on economies like the United States, which are open and market-based. And that is also true for the types of impacts that those policies have on economies like Europe, which is why uh, a large part of the, um, uh, the program that we are um, uh, looking to partner with Europe on is how we can collaborate, how we can work together to address the challenges that face both of us. Do you think uh, China uh, will be a fair player or do you, and is this the last hope to b basically bring it into the fold of, you know, uh, the way fair is, uh, sorry, trade is conducted by Western country? So um, first, uh, that's why the conversations with China will be so important in terms of assessing um, uh, the attitude uh, and the... Is it um, the last chance, basically, for them to... I think that if uh, you've listened to my speech, um, uh, I think that uh, we are very clear-eyed in terms of the patterns that we have seen. And we, many, many uh, governments and stakeholders have hoped and have worked to bring China into the community of um, uh, countries and economies that have adopted these open market norms. And we have not seen that that is the trajectory that China is on. You're hoping to change that? No, I'm hoping to manage. I'm hoping to manage that. What do you mean manage that? I mean, we, you have to change it. If you say that's not the right way to, to, to do trade, you have to change that, right? Well, whether or not that changes is not just up to us. It's not just up to Europe. It is really about choices that China is going to make. And if China is not going to make those choices, then the challenge that we have is how do we respond? How do we nevertheless take steps to effectively defend the interests of our economies, our workers, our businesses, our farmers, and our opportunity to thrive in a world economy where we will be continuing to compete and coexist. I, I want to get to uh, the revelation of the so-called uh, Pandora Papers. Uh, and what we've learned is that in addition to states like Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming, uh, there is a state in the U.S., South Dakota, uh, where apparently uh, billions of uh, dollars are uh, in trust and it, there's very little information. And they're essentially accusing uh, those papers, the U.S., of having tax havens on its soil and not doing enough uh, to fight the issue. What is your reaction to those revelations and what should be done about this loophole, it would seem? Well, I think that the president has been clear from day one, and it's been clear in his uh, policy proposals uh, during his presidency, that um, uh, it is a priority to bring more transparency to the U.S. financial system and, frankly, the world financial system. Um, I, you will also see that the president has prioritized the issue of corruption as a national security issue. And so I think that in this regard as well, uh, there is opportunity for this transatlantic relationship uh, to work towards bringing more transparency to our financial and our economic systems, including in trade. 
Right. But uh, for instance, I mean, yes, it's nice to say we're going to fight uh, corruption and tax havens, but isn't there a need to address it, uh, first of all, at home before accusing others of uh, behaving uh, badly? I mean, is the administration planning to do something about those states that have very loose regulations and allow some people tied to human rights abuses or even uh, criminal gangs, according to the Pandora Papers, to have accounts in the U.S.? So again, I'll refer to the policy proposals of this administration, and then I'll also refer to uh, my good, uh, smart, uh, and uh, uh, hardworking colleagues in the Treasury Department in terms of uh, all of the policies that they are working on to address just those issues both at home and abroad. Ambassador Catherine Tai, I want to thank you very much uh, for being with us here on the France 24 interview. Thank you for watching it, and stay tuned for more news.